What is up, investors? And welcome back to the Everything Crypto Show. I'm your host, Everything Crypto, here to bring you the latest and most important news moving the crypto markets. Now, in today's episode, we have another action-packed video for you guys with a ton of stuff to break down, including the very first proposal for reversible transactions on Ethereum and the greater implications this could have on the crypto industry as a whole. We have Crypto.com doing the single biggest crow coin burn I have ever personally seen in one transaction. And last but not least, a very well-known crypto exchange action being ordered cease and desist letters so definitely tons to get through in this video and without further ado it is time to sit back relax grab that morning cup of joe and enjoy the show happy tuesday everyone i did just want to ask that if you have not yet hit that sub and like button and join the everything crypto squad please consider doing so as the number one goal of this channel is to bring you all of the most important news that you need to know on a daily basis now with that said we are going to hop right into the video starting off with the question of the day and the question is would you you like to see reversible transactions on ethereum become a thing let me know down below this has been a very hot topic of debate since the proposal was actually launched and i do have my own opinions on this that we are going to share when we get to that segment but i do want to hear what you guys have to say about this and uh, now we're going to hop right into the charts here like we always do taking a look at bitcoin and surprisingly we've actually seen the us dollar once again hit a new all-time high today it actually topped out at about 114 before we pulled back a little bit down to this 113.8 area and Bitcoin remained flat and even more impressively we talked yesterday about how the S&P and the Nasdaq are dangerously close to actually taking out their June lows the Dow Jones has already taken out its June lows and I did expect crypto to follow suit as it really has been correlated with the stock markets for the entire year however crypto is showing a ton of resilience right now and despite the stock market breaking down below these June lows crypto is still holding up strong so very impressive to see here from Bitcoin Bitcoin and Ethereum really holding up the market, but do keep in mind that we're still in the middle of no man's land and a retest of that 17.5k June low is definitely still on the table especially if you consider the fact that we still have massive overhead resistance at that 2018 all-time high of 20,000. And even if we do get above that 20K, keep in mind that we still have massive overhead resistance here at that $21,000 level, another strong level of resistance at 22.3K, as well as the 200-week moving average sitting at 23.2K. So we are definitely not out of the woods here yet, still plenty of work to do on Bitcoin. However, the fact that it did not crater today with the overall indices was definitely a sign of some resilience and now ethereum here in a very similar situation to bitcoin we are in the middle of no man's land right in between that 200 week moving average down here at 1283 and still below that all-time high of 1400 back in 2018 so what i'm looking for on ethereum here is one of two things either a break above 1400 in which case we could potentially run back up to that 1750 zone but if we do break down below this 200 week moving average and officially close a weekly candle below it i may in fact consider Consider opening up a short position on Ethereum and letting it ride all the way down to about a thousand dollars, give or take. And as you can see here, once these cryptos do tend to break below their 200 week moving averages, clearly it has been a ton of pain and overhead resistance, as indicated by Bitcoin here, which I think has spent like 12 weeks below the 200 week since it has broken below it. We actually closed one weekly candle above it, and then boom, right after that, we came right back below it. So Ethereum will be treated no differently here, in my opinion. And if we do get below that 200 week i do expect a sustained period of time staying below it now we're going to hop into the news here starting off with the pound that has hit a record low after tax cut plans and markets are basically reacting to this with fear because the cost of uk government borrowing has climbed and markets are now speculating about an emergency interest rate hike some people are saying that it may come as soon as this week to help stem a fall in the pound and calm high inflation and if so this would come less than a week after the bank lifted interest rates by half a percentage point to to 2.25 percent and before its next official meeting on the 3rd of november so now the forecasts are actually putting interest rates at 5.5 percent or even higher by next spring and guys like let's just look at this absolute destruction of the pound where is it here it is we literally have the pound looking like an altcoin out here down 24 percent since about june of last year these currencies are crumbling versus the u.s dollar now if there's one thing that we know about governments we know that they definitely like to use these times of unrest of of really just panic to actually push their own agendas and we saw it actually happen the first time with the Terra Luna collapse earlier this year as soon as Terra
Terra Luna collapsed, these governments started trying to impose a ton of regulatory laws on crypto, pretty much using the Terra Luna collapse as their justification, trying to fear monger and say, clearly, you guys need our protection based on what just happened. This is the status quo of governments. They have done it before and they will do it again. In fact, I predict that they will use this fall in the pound and the euro to actually prepare people for digital currencies and try and label them as the new hope for our financial system. This will come sooner than you expect. Prepare. And this is based off of a tweet that I did see. He basically says to watch out for CBDC friendly coins such as XRP, Quant, and now Ethereum, all of which are in fact in our portfolio. So usually we do start off with the Bitcoin news, but I want to take a second to talk specifically about Quant because in my opinion, I think that Quant right now could be even a bigger opportunity than Bitcoin when it was in that $100 price range. So for starters here, I definitely agree with the notion in this tweet that the collapse of the pound and the euro are going to have governments pushing the CBDC agenda as sort of like the new hope for the current financial system. And who happens to work with the Digital Pound Foundation, a corporation that is in fact working on the first digital pound? Well, that would be Ripple, Quant, as well as Avalanche. So both XRP and Quant are clearly in tight here to actually launch a CBDC in the UK. And on top of that, you guys can see here that Quant is going to be a very needed token based on its use case, but there really is not a lot of Quant to go around. And this is where tokenomics come into play. This is why when I say that I truly believe Quant can become a five-figure coin, I think some people think that I'm just making it up trying to pump bags. I am not. This is pure math. So what we have here is Quant tokenomics. And basically what you can see is that Bitcoin comes in with a 21 million total supply and Quant comes in with 14.6 million. It has 33% less Quant available than there is Bitcoin. And then compare that to other projects like BNB, Link, ADA, and XRP. And you can clearly see that Quant is one of the most scarce projects in the entire crypto market with one of the biggest use cases. So definitely very bullish on Quant. And this is actually from Legit Crypto Nerd, basically talking about how Quant definitely duplicates its previous moves. The crypto market does tend to be based on historical moves. And what you can see here is that in the previous bear market, Quant corrected at 90% before actually ripping 28,500% all the way up to those highs of about $420. Now, what we have seen in this bear market is Quant once again crater 90% from $420 all the way down to about $40. And then boom, basically what he is showing you here is that if you are to take the low of this bear market and then extrapolate that another 28.5,000%, that gives you a price target of $12,000 per quant. Now, the only thing I do have to say about this is it does not account for diminishing returns, which I've definitely proven to be a thing in crypto. However, quant will only be on its second bull run by the time uh, the next bull run does actually take place. So I am definitely also willing to consider that diminishing returns will not be a very big deal for quant this time around. But even if it does suffer from diminishing returns and we're not looking at a $12,000 price target, let's say we even knock that down to $10,000. That is still a 100x from current prices. So yes, I do think that the fall of the pound could actually lead to an acceleration of CBDCs, which will only benefit these projects like XRP and Quant, in my opinion. So definitely something to keep an eye on. I am very, very bullish on Quant. And as you can actually see here based on the chart, it has easily been one of the best performers throughout this bear market, up about 200% off of those lows from down here at like $43, now sitting at $120. And I really do attribute that to a factor of both tokenomics as well as utility. And that is why you guys may often hear me say that quant is my Bitcoin, because if you line up the tokenomics, which I would argue are better on quant side than on Bitcoins, and then you factor in the actual utility that quant has as well. I mean, I think it's a little more obvious why I see this as a huge opportunity for the next bull run. But this does serve as a perfect segue into the Bitcoin segment. And we're going to talk about this tweet from Michael Saylor, obviously a very well-known Bitcoin maxi, a little bit of a toxic Bitcoin maxi sometimes, but he does make a very good point in this tweet that I do want to cover. So he says, over the past year, currencies have collapsed against the dollar. The Canadian dollar versus the US dollar is down 8%, Australian dollar 11%, the euro down 18%, the pound now down 22%, the Japanese yen 23%, and the Turkish dollar down 52% versus USD. Over the past four years, the dollar has collapsed 67% against Bitcoin. And basically what he's trying to 
say here is he's referring to the people that are very quick to bash Bitcoin when people do refer to it as an inflation hedge. And I want to talk about this because, you know, as of this year, right, obviously inflation has been soaring to the upside. And at the same time, Bitcoin has been cratering to the downside. So people are very quick to hop on the bandwagon and say that Bitcoin is most certainly not an inflation hedge. And what I would say is I've noticed a lot of people actually manipulating timelines to make this the case. Now, if you were to look at Bitcoin on a one year chart, yes, it would be very hard to argue that Bitcoin is in fact an inflation hedge, but that is very manipulative in my opinion. You cannot be looking at Bitcoin from a one year chart. You need to be looking at Bitcoin from, let's say, a five year chart. And when you zoom out here, I think this gives a very different perspective and shows you how powerful of a tool Bitcoin is to actually store your value versus the US dollar, not just store your value, but gain value against the US dollar. So yeah, really anyone can come here on a one year chart and say, wow, look, Bitcoin was all the way at uh, 60,000 and now we're all the way down to 20,000. This is not an inflation hedge. But really, if you are in crypto, you should be in here for the long term, unless you are a swing trader. And long term to me means a three to five year outlook. And if we do take that long term perspective, I think it's almost undeniable that Bitcoin is definitely a better store of value than the US dollar, than gold, than any of these other holdings. And that is why I remain bullish on Bitcoin for the long term. I do still see it as a store of value, even when that is not a popular narrative, but I don't really care what a popular narrative is. It's very simple when it comes to Bitcoin. Your government can print as much money as they want. They can continue to devalue your dollar. Bitcoin only be, only gets more valuable with time. It is literally computer generated money that is made to gain value over time. And if you don't believe that, just ask the miners who are struggling right now as network difficulty is ripping to new all time highs. We have energy costs at all time highs as well, which is really hurting miners pockets. And last but not least, we have Bitcoin. Bitcoin actually down here at 20,000. So all the all the actual Bitcoin that these miners are gaining as the rewards are just not worth as much. So miners are struggling. And why is that? Because Bitcoin is made to become more scarce with time. When miners are struggling, the uh, the Federal Reserve cannot simply just print more Bitcoin to help them out like they did with the US dollar. That is why Bitcoin is hardwired computer generated money that is said to gain value over time. And I think that if you really zoom out from a longer term perspective, this becomes very obvious. So I like that tweet from Michael Saylor, because especially with currencies collapsing left, right and center, this is literally why Satoshi made Bitcoin, because this is a form of currency that nobody can manipulate and make more of. In fact, there will become less and less of this with time. And from a very, very simple supply and demand perspective, that makes Bitcoin one of the most valuable currencies globally, in my opinion. So I just wanted to kind of talk about that because I think think there's a lot of like mixed narratives out there about Bitcoin and people can feel free to disagree, but I absolutely think it is undeniable that Bitcoin is a much better store of value than any of these fiat currencies, provided that you have a longer term outlook and that you are not in here trying to make a quick buck in under a year's time. So now we're going to talk about institutional investors and what they think about Bitcoin as they are actually short selling Bitcoin at the highest rate on record. So what you can actually see here is that short Bitcoin investment products rose to 160 72 million in assets under management and this is the highest on a record which did prompt some profit taking with the first outflow here in seven weeks totaling 5.1 mil so i think it's very interesting that we're seeing a ton of short bitcoin inflows right now and the one thing that i can hypothesize is that because the s p and the nasdaq have actually turned over and gone below their june lows and now we see these institutional investors looking at bitcoin still holding strong i think that they are pretty much betting it is inevitable that Bitcoin will actually follow the overall indices in this fall to the downside. And in fact, I can't say I totally disagree. I do really think that if the markets continue to move down, there is no way that we see the crypto markets just simply move sideways while the stock market is panicking. Clearly, they are all moving together right now. And despite the little disconnect this week, there has been a very high correlation between Bitcoin and the overall indices. So definitely something to keep an eye on as shorts are in fact piling into Bitcoin. And we do have one more piece 
piece of news here from an analyst who nailed the end of the crypto bull market and he has abruptly changed his stance on Bitcoin talking about a new trend incoming and basically what he's saying here is that he kept his entire macro bearish thesis all the way until Bitcoin took out the lows on September 9th and now he does have a more neutral look on Bitcoin. What he's talking about here is the fact that the Fed expressed his intention to keep hiking interest rates until it hits 4.6% in 2023 and what he basically believes is that Bitcoin is due for a short-term relief rally before a final capitulation phase that will set the stage for Bitcoin to transition to an extended sideways trend. And this definitely sort of echoes what we've been saying about the overall markets is I am expecting one more capitulation phase, one more sell off on Bitcoin before we can actually enter that accumulation phase. We are looking at Bitcoin right now in a macro environment it has never been in before. We have never been in a recessionary environment with Bitcoin. I mean, that definitely serves as some perspective for how early we are to this entire market. But I do believe that this pain is not yet done, that we do have one more capitulation phase before entering the accumulation phase and that doesn't mean we have to go to 9,000, 5,000. In fact, he's putting his worst case scenario at 12 to 14,000 for Bitcoin and if you guys have been watching, you know that the two key levels I am personally looking to buy more Bitcoin at are actually 15,000 and then 12,000 respectively. So I do still think that we could see this final capitulation phase and from there we will enter accumulation before we re-enter the bull run. Now we're going to move into the Ethereum news here and as you can see, since the merge has gone live, we have minted 83 300 new ethereum so yes ethereum has not been deflationary since the merge has gone live but you can see here that if we were still under proof of work we would have minted 147,000 new eth in that same time period so the merge is in fact really acting as it was expected to by reducing that issuance by 95 percent that is going to be very powerful for ethereum in the long term and once we do enter the bull market once we see some increased uh really just activity on the network and these gas fees go back over 16 gas that is when we will in fact see ethereum become deflationary and that is when i really think that the supply shock for eth will come into play now we're going to spend a decent amount of time this video talking about some staking options for ethereum to really help you guys get some passive income from this blue chip but i think we're gonna have to put that on the back burner for tomorrow because this article here takes much more serious precedence and this is an article that was released basically pushing for reversible transactions on ethereum through new e ERC-20 standards, ERC-20R, and ERC-721R. So basically what this says here is, aren't you thinking that this defeats the entire purpose of the blockchain? Yes, that is exactly what I think when I hear irreversible Ethereum transactions. But they are saying that this is not meant to replace ERC-20 tokens or make Ethereum reversible. It simply allows short time windows post-transaction for thefts to be contested and possibly restored. Note that a transaction is only freezable for a short amount of time, say three days before it becomes irreversible. So I kind of want to break down how exactly this would work because this is going to be a very, very controversial thing. I don't really know what side you guys are going to lean on when it comes to this, but I really do want to know in the comments down below. So please answer that question because I think this is going to be a very hot topic of debate for the next little while. And effectively, this is how it would work. Number one, let's say someone is a victim of theft. They are going to request a freeze on the stolen funds. Then two, judges accept or deny a freeze request. And this would obviously be a decentralized quorum of judges, most likely people who are in fact validating the Ethereum network. Now three, if the, if the judges do rule that this was in fact a suspicious uh, transaction, the governance contract will call freeze and it will execute this freeze. Now number four, you will go to trial where both sides can present evidence to the decentralized set of judges and then the judges will reach a decision at which point they instruct the governance contract to call either the reverse or reject reverse function. So obviously if reverse is in fact called into play then the then the funds will be sent back to the original address and if reject reverse is called the freeze will be lifted and then five reversal if applicable the reverse function sends the frozen assets back to the victim <sighs> this one is interesting um now, right off the bat, I'm going to say, you know what? I know that theft is obviously a massive problem in crypto. That's why we always talk about having cold storage, about managing your own keys. 
However, I do still think that even after reading this, that this completely defeats the purpose of a blockchain, of a decentralized blockchain in which these transactions are irreversible. That is literally the entire value proposition of the blockchain is the fact that you have all these different blocks actually going ahead and confirming transactions. And once they have gone through, they have gone through. In fact, I think that for the most part, if the blockchain is used correctly and if people are using cryptocurrency safely, the blockchain can do a much better job at actually like really reducing the impacts of fraud and theft. But the unfortunate truth is because the industry is still new, because a lot of people are susceptible to hacks and like fish links, that is why we see a lot of these hacks go through right now. But I really think that the main function of the blockchain is to really reduce the amount of fraud and theft that occurs. And I kind of think that this is a little bit counterproductive. I understand it's kind of like an iffy situation because theft obviously sucks. And if anybody has had their funds stolen, I'm sure you would have loved to find a way to sort of go back on that and get those funds reversed. But I would encourage you to sort of think about like the broader implications for the blockchain when it comes to this proposition. And honestly, I was a little bit undecided before talking about this, but the more I think about it, the more I think that this is probably not the best idea for Ethereum. In fact, that would probably just make the argument for its centralization even more relevant. And at that point, like how is this any different from a bank freezing your transaction if Ethereum Ethereum can do the same thing. So I'm personally not a fan of this. And obviously the community is pretty much split right down the middle. However, I also would have to say, like, how do we assure that there is a decentralized court that is truly decentralized and that is not doing something for their own favor? Like what if the, what if the thief reaches out to this decentralized court and says, Hey, if you guys let me take these funds, I'm going to give you all 10% of the funds stolen. Like, how do we know that that will not happen? So personally, I think there's just way too much overhead risk with the ability to start reversing transactions on the Ethereum chain. I think it would be a disaster. And that is why, although I do understand the benefits of it, I'm going to have to say that overall, this would be terrible for ETH. And uh, once again, please let me know what you guys think about that. But now that we're kind of running through this, that is just my two cents on the matter. And now we're going to talk about Crow here as we have seen the single biggest burn in Crow history, at least to my knowledge, in one transaction. So if you guys actually go back and take a look at my previous videos, you would notice that the balance in this wallet address for Crow used to be $77.347 billion. Now if we take a look at the wallet, it says $77. 7.447 billion and uh yeah i had to do a little double take here make sure it was correct and then when i went over to this burn site crypti.io you will in fact notice that in the past 24 hours we went from having 77.347 billion crow burned to 77.447 billion crow burned. That means that in the past 24 hours, crypto.com has burned 100 million crow in a single transaction, once again, removing another 0.1% from this float. And that is insane, guys. When you really break this down over the long term, think about the fact that three years ago, there was 100 billion crow flying around. We're pretty much almost down now to about 26.5 billion and what if we continue these burns what if in another couple years we're down to 20 billion crow and then 10 billion and this is why when you factor in that long-term perspective plus the passive income that crow can generate through the DeFi wallet this project is a passive income and really like price appreciation machine in my opinion because the more crow that we burn the more valuable all of that crow that you are earning is it is more valuable it contributes to a larger percentage base of the flow and that is why I keep an eye on this burn wallet so much. So I did just want to hop on here and let you guys know that crypto.com, I see you. I see what you're doing. I don't know if any of you on the team watch these videos. Probably not, but I'm watching you and uh, I see this 100 million burn. So if you are bullish on Crow, this is definitely good news for you. And now we're going to wrap this up talking about some centralized exchange news. We have Drama, Kraken, Nexo, Voyager, FTX, Binance, Celsius, you name it. We got to talk about it. So starting off with the new Kraken CEO, he says that their crypto exchange will not be registering with the SEC because they don't handle securities. I love it. 
That's all I got to say about that. That's all we had from Kraken. They are still operating as well, and I love to see that CEO taking a stand versus the SEC. Now, here is the unfortunate piece of news for Nexo, one of the biggest crypto exchanges globally. I, I believe it's a top 10 exchange. I know it's very, very popular, and uh, basically seven states have ordered a halt to Nexo's earn interest product accounts, accusing the company of improperly offering unregistered securities, and this does include the likes of New York and California, saying they must stop its unlawful operations and take necessary action to protect its investors because they are not licensed and registered. And uh, I think that this is definitely very interesting. I also do believe this is why we've seen these uh, these platforms like Crypto.com really tone back on their crypto earn products as of late, because clearly the SEC is not a fan of this. And now Nexo is in fact being sued for offering these unregistered securities, quote unquote, and offering them an interest bearing accounts. So this could definitely be very troublesome for Nexo in the long run. I know that a very big portion of Nexo, the reason people sign up is because of these interest bearing accounts and I do believe that if they get shut down Nexo is really going to be considered no different than any other centralized exchange and I think that's going to be a massive step back for Nexo so while they are not like insolvent um, you know in terms of like their balance sheet they are operating healthily to the best of my knowledge just this regulatory overhead could definitely be a problem for them and that is why once again I love the approach that crypto.com and even that Binance and FTX have been taking about getting regulatory approval first and then offering their products as opposed to doing it the other way around because clearly it has come back to harm Nexo and I am curious to see how this does play out. Now Voyager Digital CFO has exited after a five month term and there is a new CEO actually taking over the former CFO position and more interestingly than that we have FTX, Binance and now a third competitor Crosstower competing to buy Voyager Digital's assets and we're keeping a very close eye on this for a very simple reason. The reason being is that whoever acquires Vo uh, blah, sorry, whoever acquires Voyager Digital's assets here is going to acquire not only their crypto, but also all of their customers. And to me, this is going to be a very big deciding factor on who is really in a much stronger position going into the next bull run. So as of right now, we know that Binance is the clear winner right here. They're in the lead as the largest crypto exchange in the world. And then in second place, I do believe we have crypto.com. And then in third place, I really think it's a, tw a tie between like FTX, Coinbase and this is why this bid is so important because if FTX acquires Voyager Digital's assets and their customers I definitely think that this will put them a lot more on par with crypto.com whereas if Binance wins Voyager Digital's assets and customers it's pretty much just giving them another head start that they already have and I do believe that long term crypto.com will close this gap so keeping a very close eye on this auction and obviously as soon as we do get any news based on you know somebody who may have actually won and gets to claim all of Voyager's assets and customers, I do plan to keep you guys updated as always. So on that note, I hope you guys did enjoy the content in today's video. You know what to do. If you made it all the way to the end, you are an absolute champion. Let me know in the comments down below. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you all enjoyed. I hope you are all having an amazing day and I hope to catch you in the next one. Peace out for now.